Welcome to this commentary on Marginal Revolution University's great video on elasticity in slave redemption. What I'm going to do here is just try and highlight a couple of the concepts that we've been focusing on class and add to the analysis done by Tyler Cowan. This is a pretty tragic topic, and in some ways it's tough to talk about, but let's give it a try. Let's keep in mind that in the modern world there still really is a lot of slavery, and many people are rightfully outraged by this. But the question is what to do about it. So in the 1990s there were humanitarian reformers, and they went to Sudan. All right, one thing that we want to make relatively clear here, so we can remember for later, is that when we look at just Sudan here, we're looking at a relatively narrow geographic market, right? And when we have a relatively narrow geographic market, we would think of there being a more elastic supply curve, right? And why would that be? Well, you can think about like, say, the market for cars. If we said the market for cars in all of Africa, right, and we went through and looked at that, that market, eh, if the price for cars in Africa went up a little bit because the demand increased, uh, you know, some other markets would try and bring uh, cars to Africa, but it's gonna be kind of costly. There's a lot of people in all of Africa and that could be quite the big change. But if we talk about bringing cars just to Sudan, well, in that situation, if the price of cars in just Sudan went up, the supply response could be quite quick. We could get cars from Ethiopia coming in, right? We could get uh, cars from Saudi Arabia coming in. We could get cars from Libya coming in. We could get cars from Egypt coming in at relatively little to no cost because it's so close and we could make those changes quickly. So when we narrow the geographic market that we have, that supply is going to be relatively elastic. Just a small increase in the price and markets are going to respond to that quite quickly by increasing the quantity. To make it even more extreme, imagine that in the capital of Sudan, in Khartoum, that we have an increase in the demand for cars and so the price goes up a little bit. Now, quite clearly, we're going to be able to redistribute cars from other areas of Sudan and Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, etc., quite quick, quickly to the capital of Khartoum and we'll see a great response in terms of quantity to just a small increase in price. Well, when we get a great increase in quantity to a small increase in price, we have something very elastic. And their plan was to buy slaves and set them free. Now that sounds great. What could be better than setting free slaves? That sounds pretty noble, but did it actually help stamp out slavery? Or did paying slaveholders to release these slaves lead to more people being captured? Let's use the economic concept of the elasticity of supply to help understand this better. The problem is this. The people trying to free the slaves, we'll call them the slave redeemers, they're also creating additional demand for slaves. After all, they're buying slaves in the market. That additional demand shifts out the demand curve for slaves and it leads to a new and higher market price. That higher price will bring forth additional supply. So what are the people who round up and kidnap the slaves, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to increase their operations, they're going to have more raids, and they're going to take more people into slavery. But we can already see there's at least a possibility that buying the slaves and setting them free will be counterproductive because we haven't managed to stamp out all of slavery. What we've done is set some people free, but actually give those kidnappers, those people in the middle, we've increased their incentives to bring more people into slavery. And therein lies the potential for an even greater tragedy. The concept of elasticity in economic terms, that refers to how responsive is quantity supplied when market price changes. It's going to help us understand how much a slave redemption program will increase the number of people who end up captured by slave raiders. Inelastic supply means that even a much higher price doesn't result in a much larger quantity supplied. In that case, even if the price of slaves went up by a lot, not that many additional people would be captured. That's the better case scenario. 
It also means the price of slaves will go up and stay high because the offsetting supply response is weak and it's not pushing that market price back down again. Again, that's the better case scenario. It means that in the long run, the redeemers are doing more to limit slavery than to encourage it. How could we show that this program is doing more to limit slavery than to encourage it on this graph? Because if we look at this simple graph here, we can go through and we can say, hey, this original quantity, right, this Q1 here, right, when we increase the demand, we've increased to this Q2, right? So we've increased the quantity from Q1 out to Q2, which seems like it's saying, hey, there's more slaves. More slaves would be a bad thing. What we have to do is we have to distinguish what's going on here. The original demand curve here is the demand just of the bad guys in the market. So we could call this our bad guys demand curve, right? When we add to this market by bringing some redeemers into the market to purchase slaves, some good guys coming in trying to set the slaves free and redeem them, we get this second demand curve out here. This demand curve is not just the demand for the good guys, though. It's the market's demand. So we can say it's the demand for the bad guys and the good guys combined. So that's our new demand curve out there. So what we get is, yes, when we add to the demand, we get a greater quantity, Q2. But what we also do is we raise the price. So we raise the price of slaves in this market. Now, nothing has changed the demand for the bad guys. Their preferences haven't changed. Their willingness to pay at different prices hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is the price has increased. And now with an increased price and the same demand curve still existing, right, we're going to move along our original demand curve, right, up to the quantity where the price now hits the original bad guys demand curve. And this will be the quantity, right, here. This will be the quantity that the bad guys actually get on the market now with this new market condition, right? And so what we have, what we can distinguish is we can say, hey, from our original equilibrium point Q1, our bad guys actually reduce from Q1 back to QB the number of slaves that they have. Unfortunately, the number of slaves on the market, the supply does respond, right? The number of slaves on the market has actually increased from Q1 out to Q2. So we have encouraged slavery to some extent, but we've also gone through and reduced slavery to some extent. Now what we can say is that we have reduced slavery more than we have encouraged it because the distance between Q1 and QB is greater than the difference between Q1 out to Q2. Now what you can see here also is that what we have is we have a certain quantity of slaves that are purchased by the bad guys up to QB. Right? But we said the total amount of slaves on the market is all the way out to Q2. So we moved all the way out to Q2. So the total number of slaves right, is this amount all the way out to Q2, but the slaves by the bad guys right, is just out to QB. Well, what does that mean for us then? If the total comes all the way out to Q2 and the bad guys have purchased the guys just to QB, well, what that means is that this area here, right, between our bad guys quantity, quantity B, and Q2 is actually the number of slaves that have been freed, that have been redeemed. So this would be the quantity that our good guys are actually purchasing and setting free. Right? And so we can go through and we can kind of analyze this entire graph and we can look at it and make the case that in this situation with this elasticity, the program is doing more to limit slavery. The reduction in the amount of slaves that the bad guys have right, is greater than the encouragement of slavery on this graph here. But however, let's say the supply curve is more elastic. That means a flatter curve. All right, so if we do the same analysis that we just did, but now with the assumption that the supply curve is flatter, that it's more elastic, what result would we get?
Well, we can see that we flattened out the supply curve from the original example. And so here we can say, okay, the original equilibrium point is still the same. We're going to have this Q1 in this situation. But now with the flatter supply curve, right, what has happened is our equilibrium point Q2 is a much greater quantity. However, the price hasn't gone up so much. It's gone up very, very little. With this increase in price, we can analyze what happens to the original demand curve, the demand curve of those bad guys, as opposed to the demand curve of the bad guys and the good guys. So if we go back and look at just the demand curve of those bad guys, well, we can say that demand curve is still going to exist. And at this higher price, right, where does that higher price hit our original demand curve of the bad guys? Well, we can see it would be at this approximate point QB. So what have we done? We have discouraged some slavery a little bit, the decrease from Q1 to QB, but we've also encouraged slavery from Q1 out to Q2 as we have increased the demand for slaves. Now, there's some good to this story because all of the slaves purchased between QB and Q2 are going to be quantity of slaves consumed by the good guys. But this still isn't that great of a story because we still have a large number of slaves being purchased by the bad guys. The reduction in slavery has been very small, whereas the encouragement of slavery has been quite large. Right? And so what we end up with in this situation is a scenario where a lot of people have been purchased into slavery or have been, come into slavery but then have been purchased by the good guys and are now out of slavery right so that's a good thing that the right people are purchasing them but nonetheless we still encouraged a number of people to be brought into slavery and we've done very little to actually reduce the quantity that are going to the bad guys now, does it make sense to assume this flatter supply curve as opposed to the earlier case, right? Does it make sense to say that the situation is more like this where the supply curve is flat and quite frankly, we get kind of a bad outcome where we discourage slavery very, very little. Does it make sense to use this assumption of a flat supply curve? Unfortunately, the answer is probably yes for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, especially when we consider this market in the long run or over time, right? Over time, supply curves, due to the second law of supply, get flatter, right? And for another reason, as we kind of mentioned earlier, when we have a narrow, narrower definition of the size of our market or a narrower market that we're analyzing, the elasticity of supply is going to increase. We're going to have a greater elasticity when we define a small market. Well, in this situation, we define our market as Sudan, and we don't define it as all of Africa or a much larger area. And so since we have kind of a small market that we're considering, right, the supply curve is going to be fairly flat in this situation. A small increase in the price for slaves will drive individuals bad guys to bring sl more slaves into this market, right? Because there's a, a slight increase in the price for slaves here and there's slaves elsewhere. They could sell them elsewhere or they could sell them here. With this increase in price, they're going to bring them to Sudan and sell them here. And it means the quantity supplied to the market will increase a lot with the higher price. In that case, it's easier to find more people to enslave. Then, as a result of the boost in demand from the humanitarian redeemers, a lot more people will end up captured and enslaved. And then, the total number of people captured as slaves is going up quite a bit. And you have to wonder, in that case, are these slave redemption programs really a good idea? So what's the answer? It's genuinely hard to say whether the supply of slaves is elastic or inelastic, but we can look at price as a possible indicator of which scenario is more likely to hold. We know that in the early years of slave redemption, there was a noticeable increase in the price of slaves, and that could be evidence of a fairly inelastic supply curve. 
However, over time, the price of slaves has fallen, and that could indicate greater elasticity of supply in the longer run. Here, once again, I just wanted to note that this is a valuable example of the second law of supply, as Tyler explains. That makes sense because suppliers are usually more responsive to an increase in price as they have more time to adjust. For instance, they can hire more people and expand their operations. So this evidence overall suggests that perhaps the program has become less effective over time, and perhaps today it may actually be counterproductive and be increasing the burden of slavery. In other words, good intentions aren't always enough. If someone comes along and puts an apparently good idea on the table, we still need to think through its unintended consequences.